Welcome to episode 30 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian for 12 years and counting, I found myself asking the question, where is the podcast that will help me do my job? I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that the ideas expressed in this podcast are my own and do not reflect those of my district. When incorporating research, I always cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. Before I jump into this week's topic for discussion, I did want to briefly revisit last week's episode, Burnout and Self-Care. I do try to keep my podcast upbeat and positive, but I think this particular episode addressed the reality that many of us face, particularly during this time of the school year, when it is wrapping up, staffing is being decided for next year, and the districts are looking to save money. I briefly mentioned a resource without really knowing any details, and I wanted to elaborate today, and that is the EAP, otherwise known as the Employee Assistance Program. While not mandated to offer this benefit, many districts do because, quite honestly, it isn't a particularly expensive benefit to offer. I am relying on my sister, who is a senior HR manager for a Fortune 500 corporation, for this information. You can usually find informational flyers where your building posts all federal and state regulations, as well as worker rights and employer obligations, depending on whether you work for a public or a private school district. This confidential support can address problems concerning your family and children, marital and relationship conflicts, stress, grief, loss, alcohol, and other drug use. It is 100% confidential, and because of HIPAA, the nature of the assistance provided will never be disclosed to your employer. This service can sometimes offer referrals also for legal assistance, financial advisors, elder care referrals, as well as child care references. Because, as we discussed last week, some stress can be addressed with a walk or a phone call to a trusted friend or going to see the latest Avengers movie, chronic stress is not healthy, nor is it sustainable. Please make sure that you're taking care of yourself, looking for the warning signs when you see them, because you are not alone. I did want to start today by thanking our listeners in... uh, the United States, as well as around the world, Uh, particularly Joy in North Carolina. Thank you very much this week. And Michelle in Michigan. It was really great to connect. I do want to extend a special welcome to our listeners in the UK and South Africa. I do welcome all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions, either on Facebook or Twitter, or using the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you remember to include a mailing address, I will be sure to send you a podcast sticker. Earlier this week, Pernil Rip, a name I will always mispronounce, posted a link to the Global Read Aloud resources. I'll include a link in the show notes. Started in 2010 with participants in 86 different countries around the world, this is a six-week program which takes place this year between September 30th to November 8th. It includes five recommended picture books for our youngest readers, an early reader title, a middle grade title, and a YA title. You can sign up for newsletters, you can find pacing guides for the chapter books, and suggested social media tags so you can connect online. Also, there are Facebook study groups and suggestions on how you can connect your students with classrooms around the world also participating in the Global Read Aloud. It's especially nice, I feel, to know these titles well in advance of the September start. In my experience, these titles will get checked out and will be in constant circulation for most of the fall. If you want to get a jump, add these titles to your own summer reading list and consider making sure you have copies ready to be circulated in September. If you've already spent your budget for the school year, like I have, there's a possibility you might have a little petty cash sitting around because of some book fines which have finally been paid, and it wouldn't be a bad investment at all. 
make sure you check out the resources. Perneal Rip does an amazing job. It's an incredibly thoroughly thought out program. And this being the ninth year that it has been uh, celebrated around the world, I, it really is a spectacular program. And my teachers who participate are always glad they do. I am very grateful that there's bookriot.com because I find their articles timely and really worth sharing. Ramadan begins, actually, tonight, Sunday, May 5th, when I'm recording, and will be res- observed by Muslims around the world for the next 30 days. Ramadan slowly makes its way around the different times of the year because the dates are determined by the lunar calendar. I know years ago, Ramadan fell during the Summer Olympics, which posed an interesting challenge for observant athletes who were competing. I know here in the Metro Detroit area, when Ramadan occurred in August, many of the coaches adjusted the fall sports schedule so that uh, student athletes would be safe during practices during the muggiest time of the year for us. Anyway, Book Riot posted a great resource, I'll include it in the show notes, 30 Books for 30 Days of Ramadan. This list includes books for adults and children of all ages, and it's definitely worth checking out if you're looking to diversify your collection. You may also want to be aware, if you have any co-workers who are observing Ramadan this month, that fasting takes an enormous toll, and it really can make working around people who aren't observing Ramadan very challenging. So to all my listeners in the United States, this week is Teacher Appreciation Week, and that means school librarians get to be included in the fun. Because the history and teacher in me can't help it, uh, quote, people in the United States started celebrating National Teacher Day in 1953 when Eleanor Roosevelt persuaded Congress to set aside a day to recognize educators. It didn't become a national holiday until March 7, 1980, after the National Education Association, along with its Kansas and Indiana state affiliates and the Dodge City, Kansas local chapter, lobbied Congress. People continue to celebrate uh, the day in March until 1984 when the National Parent Teacher Association designated the first full week of May as Teacher Appreciation Week. The following year, the NEA voted to make Tuesday of the week National Teacher Day. The NEA describes the National Teacher Day as, quote, a day of honoring teachers and recognizing the lasting contributions they make to our lives, end quote, Thank you, Hallmark.com, for that bit of historical context. Never did I ever expect to use a greeting card company's website for my research. But whether you work in the United States or you are part of the 32% of our listening community around the world, I hope you feel appreciated, not just this week, but every week. I can say in my teaching career that Teacher Appreciation Week varies from school to school and from district to district. And the celebrations at the elementary level tend to uh, last across the entire week and uh, usually is done in coordination with the PTO and a billing administration. At the secondary level, it tends to be limited to a day or two, a staff luncheon, and perhaps treats in the lounge. I would suggest that you keep your eyes open this week for special discounts online. Oftentimes, they're offering educator specials and discounts. You may see reduced prices at area restaurants and local businesses. Some of my more memorable teacher appreciation celebrations included scratch-offs in my mailbox. One of my coworkers won $250. Treats in the staff lounge, breakfast, lunches. Members of the PTO who pushed around a, an afternoon snack cart and served ice-cold pop, that is what we call it in Michigan, and bags of chips and cookies, and ice cream sandwiches. And one building offered um, five-minute massages with uh, a masseuse who came in and did like head and shoulders, and they brought in the chair. It was kind of fun. Um, I did very much enjoy receiving the student-made thank you notes, which are hand-delivered to me during the week, and I tape those up in my office, and I like those a lot. If you ask Facebook when the end of the school year is, you will get a very wide range of dates, um, which 
this is by no means researched, I've been able to ascertain, thanks to the Facebook forums this week, that the earliest districts in the United States are closing May 16th. The latest I've seen is June 25th, and that was due to the hideous winter that we had uh, here in the United States. Um, I do want to apologize to our listeners in Australia and New Zealand, whose second term will not end until July 5th. I'm also aware that while many schools in the United States follow a traditional calendar in which our libraries and our schools will be closed for approximately two months, the school holiday in Australia and New Zealand are such that they are closed for two weeks at a time. And the reason I was wondering this is because I'm trying to plan my springtime episodes and I realize that try as I may, I'm not going to be able to sync with everybody's end of the year activities and what's going on in their library. So every year in every school I have ever taught in, um, I have received three weeks prior to the school closing a checkout list. And every year since I've become a school librarian, so the past 12 years, I have basically written N.A. or not applicable on nearly every line, turned in my keys at the main office, and walked out. It never occurred to me to generate a list of my own. Perhaps writing out a list would have only added to my stress. I know that I consider myself lucky at that moment looking at the three-page list that I was glad I was not a classroom teacher. I do actually have a copy of one of these checkout lists, and uh, you'd be amused to hear the, I think it's 21 items. Yes, 21 items. And again, I think I wrote NA to all of it. Um, Educational record cards. Um, I do provide grades for all of my students, but those are submitted electronically. I'm not actually handing in anything in paper. Uh, Item number two, student progress reports, which are also due a week before school gets out. And um, number three are the cumulative files. Um, I honestly don't know what those are, but apparently number three is cumulative files. Number four, we have to complete our data doc for all of our students, which means all the data we collected on our students has to be submitted on a shared Google doc. Uh, We have to provide, and uh, this is elementary, so obviously not applying to anybody in the middle school or high school, but uh, F&P summary information. Uh, Item number six, we have to prepare the materials we're giving for our summer uh, booklet to our students, so the activities that the students are going to do in the summer packet. Item number seven would be finalizing the class lists for the next year. Item number eight, updating our SMART goals which are grade level, and uh, those are in a Google Drive. Um, Item number nine means we have to collect and store our textbooks, thankfully not in the library. That happens in the classroom. Any um, computer or, say, technology that's been checked out has to actually get turned in, and I'm also very grateful that that is not my responsibility. Uh, Item number 11, all of the bulletin boards have to be taken down or completely covered with a separate piece of paper if you are leaving anything up like the trim. Uh, And uh, then the obvious, clearing off the desktops and tables. And, you know, that is pretty obvious. But it does mean everything has to be locked up and put away, especially if the room is being used for summer school. Item number, goodness, 14. uh, All of your iPads and Chromebooks have to be locked up in the cart and uh, taken up to the third floor where we have a uh, storage. Um, And item number 14, uh, this is something I do, but actually we had to have done on April 22nd, so I'm not quite sure why it's still on this list, but it's ordering supplies. That's already been done. Uh, Item number 15, uh, we also have to make sure that any science boxes uh, or any of the uh, reading resources, uh, the writer's workshop units and social studies binders, any of the the instructional support materials get returned to a central location, Um, any of the math workbooks, and they distinguish between things that have been used and things that have not been used, and they get turned into different places. Um, Oh, item number 16, that's me. Borrowing items must return borrowed books to the office and library and the professional library in the lounge. 
So that's nice to be item number 16. Uh, number 17, we're supposed to discard this year's uh, staff handbook. Uh, we no longer print those, thankfully, but they stay on a Google Drive, and I don't know why that's still on the list. Um, but teachers also have to do item number 18, uh, turning in your walking field trip folder to the main office. Um, our summer projects uh, have to be uh, submitted to the main office. We also have to email our custodian with any specific things we want done over the summer uh, in our classrooms. The item number 20, uh, you need to, um, if you're checking technology out for the summer, you have to make sure to do that. Uh, and then finally, item number 21, meaning you have to turn in this piece of paper and your keys to the main office sign and date at the bottom. Anyway, grateful that very little of that has anything to do with me. And while I don't have an equally impressive list of things I have to do to get my library ready to be closed down at the end of the school year, I still think that our job is particularly demanding. And list or no list, our end of the year is chaotic in its own unique way. This podcast and the episodes I've got planned for May will hopefully address many of these which are specific to the final few weeks of the school year. inspiration for this episode, Summer Plans for Your Library, came from several conversations I've had over the years regarding uh, what happens to my library when the school year ends. So I titled this episode, Summer Plans for Your Library, because it isn't about your personal plans. Rather, it is what's happening to your library while you are presumably home for summer vacation. I am aware of many librarians who spend much of the spring doing a thorough inventory. This is all consuming and extremely disruptive because you can easily get distracted and meanwhile your classes are typically still coming to the library for their classes. Uh, the end of the year also coincides with a great deal of state testing and school librarians on several Facebook forums complain that they are being pulled to proctor tests instead of running their libraries. Other librarians said their libraries were for more or less holding areas for multiple classes of more than 50 students or so during testing sessions. Many school librarians are in charge of collecting the technology from the classrooms and the staff, and all of us will devote an extraordinary amount of time to tracking down the missing books and the replacement fees for ruined ones. If you haven't heard my episode, Book Bounty Hunter, The Worst Job Ever, posted on April 1st, no fooling. Uh, I suggest you take a listen. Summertime is when many schools do renovations. Some librarians will spend these last few weeks packing up their entire collection while the construction is ongoing. I had also expected to be boxing up my collection because I was supposedly getting replacement carpeting this summer. However, all of our building improvements have been put on hold until the decisions have been made regarding which buildings will be consolidated. While I wasn't the librarian at the time, but rather a social studies teacher many years ago, when my high school was constructed in the 1970s, that is not when I was there, I'm just saying that's when my school was constructed, it underwent asbestos abatement when I was teaching there many years later. And not only did the entire building have to be vacated, our belongings, the teaching materials, but also the furniture. Needless to say, the summer is an incredibly busy time for schools, whether we're there or not. In much the same way that I worry about my library for the one day that I'm out during the school year and I have a substitute, if you haven't listened to March 11th's episode, um, and the nightmare situations which are caused when I am gone for a single day, imagine six weeks of summer school taking place in your library. I am somewhat amused because summer school's location rotates in our district to a handful of elementary schools which have central air conditioning to listen to the teachers fuss when they find out that our school is hosting summer school. I understand their objections. I'm even very sympathetic. But school librarians have come to not only tolerate, but to expect that our libraries are fair game throughout the week and throughout the school year. 
And what happens when you find out your school will use your building and your library this summer for summer school? Move whatever you can to a locked office or a storage space. Last year, I stored our stash of crayons and art supplies in a closet, but I didn't bother to lock it, only to find out this September that it had been completely ransacked in my entire year supply of crayons and art materials for the upcoming year had been wiped out. Call me crazy, but we move all of our book repair tape, tape dispensers, pencil sharpeners, staples, three ring hole punch into my office. And then even then all those items are boxed up and out of sight in case somebody locates a key. But wait, that's not all. I also load up my entire graphic novel collection and my capstone interactive history adventure series, which happens to be very expensive books and hide those away in my office. Our district doesn't have use of Fall at Destiny software, and we won't be running checkouts during the summer. I've tried to cover our bookshelves with butcher paper, and we know that's not enough to discourage books from walking away while summer school is utilizing our space. That, and it's also a colossal waste of paper. I'll return in August to find stacks and stacks of books waiting for me to be reshelved at the Cirque desk. And I know that I'd rather reshelve them than have the summer school staff decide they think they know best where those books belong. Every once in a while, an administrator will offer up the idea of keeping our library open for checkout throughout the summer. I have friends who check out uh, books to their students for the entire summer, but this would be school libraries operating during the summer like a local public branch would. Our community is really fortunate to have three gorgeous branches, all of which the students have access to. They run fantastic summer reading programs, I'll elaborate in our next episode. And I would feel much better if these administration's suggestions would be accompanied with solutions that don't rely on volunteers. I made reference last week to Angela Watson's idea that the, quote, do it for the kids Uh, end quote, is a common rallying cry used by school administrators, which can play a large role in teacher burnout. Why is the success of these programs wholly dependent on me working for free? I have plenty of fellow educators who work during the summer, and that's not because we're bored. It's because our salaries have been cut or our full-time status has been threatened. Before I had kids, I always work summer jobs to supplement what I made working at a Catholic high school. What other profession creates programs and says, hmm, how do we operate this program without actually having to pay anybody? And there is something that's rather upsetting about the idea of walking away from a library that I've nurtured and tended every day, only to leave it in the hands of community volunteers who have never attended library school. While researching this episode, I did come across an article authored by Mila Kumpilova uh, for the Pioneer Press posted on TwinCities.com titled, Metro Elementary Schools Keep Libraries Open to Combat Summer Slide, originally published in July of 2011 and then updated again in 2015. I'll attach a link in the show notes. The author describes how some area school districts have found ways to keep the school libraries available on a -a three-day-a-week basis during the summer. The evidence for the summer slide is well established, and there's no doubt that any efforts to increase student reading will prove beneficial. And while this is admirable and well-intended, I can't help but resent how these programs are being implemented. Would I feel differently if I were a building administrator or a grade-level teacher or a parent? Of course I would. But as I mentioned before, you're occupying the space, which is the direct product of all my efforts this past school year. You can expect me to be a little concerned. All of the examples described in the article were made possible using PTO fundraisers. And in every circumstance, parents, parent volunteers or teaching staff volunteers or high schools volunteers were all used. I did like one quote provided by a student which uh, regarding using the school library during the summer, and the student said, quote, Here at school, we know where the books are, and it's easier to find them, end quote. 
I did appreciate that because I hadn't thought about that. That's an interesting idea. I do appreciate the perspective of Tori Jensen, a representative of Minnesota Educational Media Organization, Minnesota's professional organization for all school library media specialists. She said, quote, We can hardly keep the media centers open during the school year, much less during the summer, end quote. The article continues, quote, according to the state library services, roughly a quarter of Minnesota school librarians have lost their jobs in the past decade, and media centers are scaling back throughout the state, end quote. What isn't surprising is how the article ended, and I'm just going to insert here. It seems like this is where the updated portion was referenced in the citation. The program is currently on hold said Colleen Peterson, the Director of Community Education and Outreach. But the program is coming back, she said. Quote, we're trying to get away from the idea that our schools shut down over the summer, end quote. I understand this idea, but exclusively depending on a volunteer workforce will make sustaining any type of program of this scale a challenge. I don't want you to conclude from this rant that I am heartless and that I'll only participate if I am compensated. I've been an educator since 1992. I've spent decades doing my schoolwork at home in the evenings and on the weekends and my summers completing graduate courses and attending conferences and workshops. I spend my free time researching for this podcast because it gives me an excuse to dive into topics for which I have an interest and little background. I've arrived at a place where I am professionally, not because I dislike what I do, but rather I finally feel like I found the best fit for me. And I would wish the same for anyone who teaches students. I am interested in considering how school libraries would pair up with other summer initiatives. Layla Nargi uh, posted an article in civileats.com on June 4th, 2018, titled, Libraries are Bridging the Summer Gap for Hungry Kids. I'll attach a link in the show notes. The author describes how public library branches are serving as locations for distribution of free meals during the summer. With the number of families living in food insecure households growing, so too does the need for free and reduced lunches, and this doesn't stop when the school year ends. In this article, Leila Nargi describes how nearly 200 public library branches in California were providing almost a quarter of a million lunches to anyone under the age of 18 while the schools are closed for the summer. The funding was made possible through the USDA's Lunch at the Library program. Apparently, the schools had originally been used for this program, but unfortunately, as school funding dried up, so did the summer programming, which drew the students to the schools during the summertime. As with the undertaking of this scale, the logistics are a challenge. The author cited the need for volunteers, and the public librarians weren't necessarily enthusiastic to have yet another expectation being heaped on them. Because our district does offer a summer school program as well as a day camp for families needing child care during the summer, I could see a way how we could justify making the school library available during uh, this time, keeping in mind that These families are paying tuition for both of these programs. Presumably, funding for the school library staff might be possible. Finally, uh, on a completely unrelated note, um, consider this. We are all podcast listeners, and recent surveys indicated that 56% of Americans have listened to a podcast at least once. But have you ever asked a coworker if they listen to podcasts? If they do... It's likely they'll open up their app, scroll through, and rattle off the ones they like the most. More often what happens is they give you this rather quizzical look, as if you misspoke. You know, podcasts, programs you can subscribe to and listen to anytime you like for free, Netflix for your ears, and if they're still looking at you weirdly, ask if you could show them on their phones. There's a really good chance they might thank you. Just as a reminder, when emailing the podcast at schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com, please include a mailing address and I'll be sure to include a thank you sticker. I would like to thank you for listening today. If you like what you hear, consider sharing it with a, a PLN or fellow school librarians in your district and perhaps leaving a rating on Apple Podcasts or oh, that would be fantastic. 
The topic for next week's episode will be summer reading programs. I hope you will tune in.